Anyway, we're happy to have as our guest speaker today, Mr. Dejan. I think I probably pronounced it wrong. Uh, an adult <laughs> services librarian at the Seattle Public Library and creator of the Fake News Survival Guide. Originally from China, he began teaching a class on fake news after library patrons started asking about questionable articles on their social media during the 2016 election campaign. And a lot of times we think of uh, political news as the main thing that gets distorted, but there's also fake crime news and fake photos that show up on our social media accounts. Um, even Barbara Bush's death was reported before she actually died. <laughs> so please help, please welcome Mr. Dijon. Dijon. You got it, Ann. Thank you so much, Anne. Thank you all for having me here. And uh, special thanks to Maureen for being my ride and organizing this whole thing. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be with you. And I'm so glad you're here and glad to be with you. Um, so my name is Dae Zhang, and I am a uh, adult services librarian at the Seattle Public Library. And we're here to talk about fake news misinformation and disinformation and all that good stuff or bad stuff. Um, so here's kind of the agenda for this morning. Uh, we're going to go over what we're talking about when we talk about fake news, uh, why this is so prevalent, why this is a pressing issue right now, um, some of the effects on our citizenship and our communities and our democracy um, that we're seeing from this. Um, and then, you know, some tips about how you can actually better evaluate content, things that you're encountering online especially. Um, I'm gonna share plenty of examples. Um, and then we're gonna, I'm gonna leave you with some final tips and best practices and some ideas to think about as you move forward um, and um, likely encounter a lot of this online. And then we're going to have a good robust Q&A. Uh, I'm really excited uh, to have you here and to get a good discussion going. Um, I always find that during a Q&A there's always at least one question that I don't know the answer about, uh, which is exciting and as a librarian especially um, gives me an opportunity to do some research and, and kind of broaden my knowledge and um, I've got some materials over here to my left, the far table, from my curriculum, the class that uh, we teach at the library. And as we're speaking right now, I actually have a colleague teaching that very class. Um, so I couldn't do the class. I came out here for you guys, um, but I have a colleague stepping up. Um, and then I've got business cards there too. So take a business card, email me um, with any follow-up questions. So why is the library talking about fake news? Well, during the 2016 election cycle, we started getting a lot of questions from our patrons uh, coming up to our library uh, desk as well as calling in on the phones, just asking about different, different news stories that they encountered online, uh, specifically through social media. And they weren't quite sure how to evaluate them and whether they were true or not true. And so this confusion over fraudulent news stories and misinformation during 2016 uh, was the impetus for us to really create a class about this topic so that we can kind of teach and discuss with folks some of the best practices and kind of the best resources to use uh, when it comes to online news. And then in the three years you know, after 2016, we have found that fake news hasn't gone away. It's actually ramped up and it's here to stay. And it's, take, it's kind of uh, taken on a life of its own in many different realms and different ways. 
Uh, we're going to touch on deep fakes a little bit later. That's kind of the newest iteration of fake news and uh, in many ways the most scariest. Uh, digital information literacy is a necessary skill in 21st century. Um, you know, even they found that even with digital natives such as myself, we have a really hard time distinguishing fake information from real information. You know, just because you know how to use the technology doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you know how to evaluate that content. And so sometimes that can be a false sense of security um, for the people who are tech savvy. They might not be digitally literate or informationally literate um, in a high, on a high level. And so I've been working a lot with librarians, educators, journalists, kind of all the stakeholders um, that really have a stake in our citizens having good information um, and being able to act on it. And in my class, it is nonpartisan. You know, I use some examples from the political realm, but I try to use a mix of examples and we really uh, don't tell people what to think, but we really just try to provide the tools uh, to allow them to figure things out for themselves. So I hope to do that today as well. I always start off with this meme that I created. So as you can tell, probably Abraham Lincoln did not say this. The quote says, never trust a quote you read in a fake news class. And I use this just to illustrate that, you know, it took me two minutes to create this image with this quote. And in another two minutes, I can share it with everybody on earth. Right? So that's the age that we live in, where we're all empowered, really. It's, I mean, the internet is so democratic. You know, if you have access <laughs> to the internet, you can contribute, you can create content, you can reach people. Um, but by that same token, you can also do a lot of harm. And um, there's so much information out there that um, you know, any robust fact checking is um, gonna really be lacking. So here's another meme that I encountered recently. Um, so, a few things stood out at me when I looked at this, right? And the thing about memes is they are designed by nature to be very easily shareable and to spread really quickly. So in this case, this is an image, oftentimes memes are like a short video or a, or a short article that uh, goes viral, right? And they're designed to be shared from person to person. And as you can see, this is in image form. So there's really no way for you, there's no way um, that you can really dig into what it's saying and fact check. Um, but there is still a way because what you can do, and in this case this is what I did, I actually pulled up a copy of the Constitution, right? And I searched. Is there a phrase, for instance, Americans only in the US Constitution? No, there is not. Right? That's very easy to check. Um, and, but most of us just don't take the time to really question that and check against you know, original sources. I also notice you know, the use of quotation marks here. Um, and just, you know, <coughs> Kind of the stance that it's taking is a very, um, it's, it's a very partisan stance and that's not always, always a red flag, but it can, you know, raise some red flags and, and definitely suggest that you should check it out when it's kind of telling you to believe something, right? And then another thing I checked was how many times the word citizen you know, comes up in the Constitution and the, per the word person actually appears more frequently than citizens. So 
perhaps this claim that citizens have rights versus just people in general in the land, that may not be accurate, right? So there's all these different things that you can actually check against the original source, the original document. And then I also noticed this kind of, you know, comparison of non-citizens and criminals, how they put those two together. Um, it was really interesting. Right? And on the other end of the spectrum, because I actually lean very liberal, um, and so the things that show up on my social media feed are things like this. Um, I, you know, you know, full disclosure, I, you know, consider myself an environmentalist as well. And so, like, a lot of my friends, a lot of things that show up on my feed um, talk about animals and environment and things like that. So I actually encounter this on a fellow librarian's page. And what's really interesting is that this particular cougar had not been spotted in over 90 years. <laughs> so I'm just trying to illustrate, you know, like from all ends of the spectrum, there's misinformation, there's misleading content, not always mis misinformation, but the headline might be misleading or it might not match up with what's actually in the article. Right, that's a very common thing. And as you can see below, there's lots and lots of emotional responses, lots of anger and tears um, and comments, right, to this article. Um, and I'm almost certain every one of those responses were from people who didn't read the article because if you read the article, you would know this, uh, that you know, this cougar has been gone for 90 years and is only officially labeled extinct recently, right? So there's really no concern to be had. It's kind of one of those things that it's, it's to drum up a certain um, engagement from a certain base of people. And it works, obviously. Um, Brazil. Brazil has been burning. Is that right? Yes, it has but this is not an image of the Amazon. So this tweet says, the Amazon rainforest produces more than 20% of the world's oxygen and it's been burning for the past three weeks. It's responsibility to help save our, it's our responsibility to help save our planet. Hashtag pray for Amazonia. So this soccer player is one of the most famous athletes in the world. And he's got hundreds of millions of followers on his various social media accounts. And he blasted this message on all of his accounts. And as you can see, there's um, 386,000 likes on this particular tweet, over 100,000 retweets. So people reposting this on their account. So a lot of, this gained a lot of traction. And this was not an image of the Amazon. Um, in fact, many celebrities and world leaders actually used uh, images that were not of the Amazon, were not of the active burning that was going on. Um, and it just goes to show that this, you know, no matter what level you're at, education, government, whatever, we're all susceptible to putting out false information. This is something that just popped up as a, like a pop-up when I was uh, reading a news article. And it says, Trump battles the FDA over Carson's breakthrough discovery. It says, quote, this will not be banned. The American people have a right to have access to this, unquote. And what this is talking about is a brain booster. That, so they're selling a product to you. And they're using all these celebrities and government people as spokespeople for this product. It's completely fraudulent. Um, but I thought it was just interesting because I'm sure you have all encountered things like this pop up on. And uh, actually in 20, I don't know the exact year, but somewhere like 2013 maybe. Um, do you remember the 
acai berry uh, weight loss yeah. thing. Yeah. That was a huge scandal, right? It was showing up on everybody's feeds and everybody's uh, computers. Um, and they actually got fined a significant amount um, from the FTC. And uh, that company went out of business. Um, so these, these types of things can raise uh, up to that level where the government has to step in and say, hey, no, you're defrauding people. So what is fake news? So this is going to be our working definition. There's a lot of definitions, but this is kind of just what we're going to be. This is our idea today that we're working with. Fake news or hoax news refers to false information or propaganda published under the guise of being authentic news. Fake news websites and channels push their fake news content in an attempt to mislead consumers of the content and spread misinformation via social networks and word of mouth. And so just an example of a fake news website, abcnews.com.co. This was one of the biggest fake news websites during 2016 uh, elections. And some of the top news stories came from this website. Now, if you didn't know any different, I mean, abcnews.com.co would sound like a legitimate website, right? And they imitate the layout. They even imitate the logo uh, and headings of, of ABC News. And so, um, you know, someone who really doesn't know which red flags to look for might not know the difference. And so, let's see, that's just one example. Oh, and I do want to mention, so the creator of that website and the operator, he was making tens of thousands of dollars. He bragged openly that he was making tens of thousands of dollars a month from the web traffic that was coming to his fake news website during the 2016 elections. So that gives you an idea of why people do this stuff as well. It makes money. So. I also want to get a little bit specific. Sorry the graphic is really hard to read, uh, but there are different types of misinformation and disinformation, as Claire Wardle uh, calls it. Um, she's with First Draft News, and so she created this graphic that I find really handy because it lets you know that there's a spectrum and there's not just one type of fake content. So it ranges from you know, a false connection, like I mentioned earlier, if the headline doesn't match what's in the actual article, that, that's a false connection, all the way to manipulated content, like you know, created, like taking something and completely manipulating it into something else. We also have on one end satire or parody. Um, a lot of news, so-called fake news websites, will operate under the guise of fantasy news. That's a label that they use in their about page. Um, or satire or parody, right? But they don't mention it anywhere on their site except that one page. Um, and again, it gets them a lot of clicks. And so they're kind of riding that line uh, of satire. Yeah, false connection, false context, manipulated content, satire or parody, misleading content, imposter content, when genuine sources are impersonated. And then all the way to fabricated content where it's new content that's 100% false, designed to deceive and to harm. So when someone you know, set, throws a label of fake news, you know, give them a question. Like, what do you mean by that? Like, what is it that is fake about it? Um, is it a questionable source? Is it a false connection? Is it completely fabric fabricated content? Because it could be a whole range. And so, you know, sometimes we throw out th these labels and then we kind of act like the conversation's done. Well, that's just the beginning of the conversation and an opportunity to dig deeper and kind of have dialogue with people. Um, quickly, I want to cover the information cycle. I love this quote from Jonathan Swift. Falsehood flies and the truth comes limping after it, so that when men come to be undeceived, it is too late. The jest is over and the tale has had its effect. And this is even truer in the digital age, where 
the lie can spread in it literally in an instant. And then we don't have a lot of resources to fact check every claim online, right? So we have to be really diligent about um, our consumption. So the information cycle, I find this graphic really helpful um, from the Library of um, Illinois, or the uh, University of Illinois libraries. And what it illustrates is that after a newsworthy event, right, the first on the scene is going to be people with their phones. You know, people, and then they're going to upload it online before anyone has a chance to investigate and write a story about it. So television, social media, and the web, they're first on the scene. But out of those three, only television really has any kind of editorial process, any type of fact-checking process. And even that takes time. So you're going to see people posting about things that happen before even TV can get on it. And so that stuff spreads right away, right? So those falsehoods can have the opportunity to spread more quickly. It's not until you, you know, it's later down the line where you have the newspapers, the popular magazines, the scholarly articles, and the um, authoritative books uh, that are written, that you really have the robust resources and time to do the fact checking, right? So right now in our 24, our uh, breaking news news cycle, right? We're all, we always want the most up-to-date information. We want it right now. And sometimes that can really work against us because the information we're likely to get is not complete and oftentimes is not accurate. So I just want to take a quick pulse of the room. Where do you all get your news? How many people, show of hands, how many people get it from TV? Nice. You mean, Mike, can use more than one. Yeah, you can use more than one. Online? Oh, about the same as TV. Wow. How about radio? Anyone still listen to radio? Nice. How about print? Wow. And how about combination? Yeah. <laughs> Seems like everyone. So you are, you know, the best example, <laughs> I would say. I always recommend getting uh, news from various sources. And not only different outlets, but different mediums. TV, online, radio, print. When it comes to online news, what is your primary source? We're going to go to the primary source now. How about social media? Anyone? Some? Yeah. How about a news website? You go straight to the site. How about an aggregator site like Apple News or Google News? Cool, a few. How about a search engine? How about a different uh, form like email or something? Yeah, newsletters. So also a little range, um, but I saw a lot of you going straight to the news website, which is interesting. So where are we now in the landscape of news and information? Well, Americans, 50% of Americans see made-up news as a bigger problem, um, a very big problem in the country today. In fact, much... Um, Many Americans see it as a bigger problem than violent crime, climate change, racism, illegal immigration, a lot of things. And most see it detrimental to the country's democratic system, right? Because it undermines our confidence in government, in each other, in political leaders' ability to get things done. And I think Anne mentioned earlier that two-thirds of Americans get news on social media, and it's rising. It used to, uh, f about three years ago, it was about to catch up to TV. Now it's way surpassed television. 
So we're in the online age. And most social uh, media news consumers expect news there online to be inaccurate. 57%. That's right. And a big reason for that is that um, they distrust the mainstream media even more in a lot of cases. So this a quote from a Gallup poll in 2016. Now only about a third of the U.S. has any trust in the fourth estate. A stunning development for an institution to design to inform the public. All right. So Americans overwhelmingly see the news media, and that's the traditional news media, as bias. Um, that's one of the reasons why they're moving online. But also people are just being, you know, becoming more digitally literate and and uh, accessing things online. 93% of Americans get at least some news online. 64% of adults say fabricated news stories cause a great deal of confusion about the basic facts about current issues and events. And then this one was really shocking to me. They did a study in 2016 um, looking at Twitter specifically. And 59% of all links shared were shared without reading first. And so it's really that like reactionary, emotional, you know, I've got to share this before I check or look into it. Yeah, very depressing. <laughs> and who's susceptible to fake news? A study just came out um, looking at, again, 2016 elections and found 11% of people over age 65 and um, shared fake news on Facebook during the election cycle. Um, but it's not just older people, it's also younger people. 80% um, so Stanford did a study and they had young students look at different advertisements as well as different um, news uh, websites and compare them. And 80% believed a native ad to be re a real news story. Meaning, have you heard the term native advertising? Yeah. No. So if you go um, on any website, any website, uh, specifically go to a news website, you'll see things that appear to be articles, but they're sponsored content or affiliated content or advertising. Usually they have a tiny label that's really faint <laughs> that designates them as sponsored content, but they completely blend in with the, with the rest of the layout of um, the, the page. And it's designed that way to get you to click on it, thinking it's a news story. Well, yes, we're, so it's on every single site you could go to. Uh, that's just how the economy of the web works now. Um, so 80% believed that the native advertising was legitimate content. 30% of students argued that the fake account was more trustworthy when comparing fake versus real accounts. Okay, so it's a huge problem. And then everyone in between, because 23% of adults overall say they have shared a made up news story knowingly or not. So how did we get here? Now each one of these topics can be a presentation in its own right, but I'm going to just quickly kind of cover what are some of the factors influencing what we're seeing today. You know, I m mentioned briefly the rise of the 24-hour news cycle. You know, with the advent of cable news, we have news all day, every day, constant. Everything's breaking news, designed to grab your attention. And if you, you know, turn on a cable news outlet, very likely you're not even going to encounter news at any particular time. You're probably going to encounter three talking heads arguing with three other talking heads, right? It's, it's that news commentary and analysis that we're getting to kind of fill in the gaps where there's actually, actually news breaking. There's decline in local journalism. So um, before the internet, how did newspapers get their revenue? Anybody? Advertising, right, classified ads. Majority of their revenue came from that, probably 90%. Right? 
right? But here comes Craigslist, where anybody can advertise to any, you know, very easily online, and that dries up the revenue. And so, as a result, uh, thousands of local newspapers have closed their doors, and countless others have downsized. And um, as a result, they're limited in what they can actually report on and the boots on the ground that they can actually put. Um, the rise of the online e economy, I kind of touched on this, it's all about clicks, right? So um, if, you're, if you're a company and you want to advertise, you're going to go online, you're going to go through something like, you know, Google AdWords or AdSense, and they're going to plug in your advertising on targeted websites and those sites don't even know what's being advertised on their site because they go through a third party. Um, but anyway, the way you, um, any particular website gets money is clicks on it and um, because of the ad revenue. And so they're incentivized to grab our attention and get us to click as much as possible, whether that's a sensational headline or crazy claims or whatever you have. And so that really ramps up um, partisanship, sensationalism, and that type of thing. Um, social media and smartphones, you know. Um, what was it? Oops, I'm sorry. Um, 2004 was when Facebook came online. And that was kind of a game changer for social networking and social media. Um, and then in 2007, we had the first smartphone, the iPhone, right? And from then on, everybody is plugged in at all times to the internet. Um, there's big data, filter bubbles, algorithms, and AI. I don't really have time to get into all that. So I just want to dig in real quickly to filter bubbles. So every single one of us has our own universe of information when we go online. How many people knew that? It's different from everybody else. Because these companies, Google, Amazon, Facebook, all these tech companies, they keep tabs on us. They keep, they know who you are and what you like. They keep all this data in order to reflect back to you the things that you want to purchase, the things that you want to engage with, the, the political content you want to engage with. And so your um, search result for the exact same term is not going to be what mine is. And this is known as the filter bubble. And so we're all in our bubbles online. Um, kind of crazy. And then the 2016 presidential election was kind of a, all these factors kind of coalescing into um, really an environment that was just opportune for misinformation and disinformation. This is a great book, Virtual Unreality. Check it out, it's by Charles Seif. And um, it really talks about this online economy and this online environment that I've been talking about. Um, there's a great quote from it that says, the media are being driven further and further into the cut and paste realm by the unforgiving economics of post-scarcity information. It's expensive to be a primary news gatherer. So he talks about this term, uh, post-scarcity information. And it's true because online we have so much information at our fingertips. Everybody can go online and dump information. <laughs> and, but it also becomes just like a pile of garbage that you have to sort through, right? And he talks about the economics of it. Like, did you know that a lot of the news articles that you're going to encounter online are written by bots, no. by algorithms? It's happening especially in sports and in, um, what else do they, can they report on pretty easily? So sports for sure, because it's just like, you know, creating a story with algorithms using the statistics. Um, but like just regular news reporting is being done with bots now too. And so 
And a lot of these uh, so-called news websites, they're aggregator sites too. So they might use the algorithm and pull from like five different articles about the topic and just create its own. Um, so that, you know, it's not technically plagiarizing, I guess, but it's, it's not any actual reporting. And then filter bubble, talked about that briefly. And then 2016, a huge factor was Russia as well, right? So some of the things that Russia did, um, I mean, there was a coordinated effort to undermine U.S. elections. They probed state voter databases. They hacked into campaigns, uh, sowed distrust and division um, into, um, you know, within social media with fake accounts and such. And then one of these, some of these fake accounts, one, one example is um, black elevation on the left side. So this was um, kind of in the, in the vein of like Black Lives Matter and kind of, um, you know, positivity for, um, for African-Americans. So it was that kind of content within um, that uh, page. And you'll see actually it says that they're hiring for positions. Um, and so they curated content uh, along those lines, but it was completely a fake, uh, a fake operation. And actually there was a new breaking news story uh, earlier this year that the biggest Black Lives Matter uh, page on Facebook was actually a fake account. And then um, this other example is called Mindful Being. So they had content about mindfulness, meditation, and things like that. And they gained a lot of followers uh, because of their message, right? People that were um, kind of attracted to that message. But they actually started putting out political content uh, after a while, and more and more partisan. And so, Facebook, you know, these examples were one of many that came on Facebook's radar and they looked into it and found connection to uh, Russia and uh, specifically the IRA, Internet Research Agency out of Russia. And so they closed these accounts down. So, and this is, um, I'm going to talk briefly about how fake news uh, creation is a business. So using the country of Macedonia. In particular, a city, a very small city called Valis uh, in Macedonia. So this report from CNN says, uh, Valis used to make porcelain for the whole of Yugoslavia. Now it makes fake news. <laughs> the, in 2016, um, there were over 100 websites that were tracked to be from that small town. And people were just popping up these websites with U.S. political content. Many of them had uh, URLs that would lead you to believe they were based in the U.S., but they were outside the country. And to basically just drum up, um, drum up support for one side or the other type of a thing and to get clicks. And each click adds cash to their bank account, so it's very clear why they do it. Just going to briefly go over some of the trends in the last few years. So politics dominated, not surprisingly, in 2016. Uh, this was the most shared uh, fake news story of 2016. Pope Francis, Pope Francis shocks the world, endorses Donald Trump for president. <laughs> Macedonia, Russia, and other foreign influence. Uh, misleading URLs. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of them will say like uspolitics.com or something like that. Um, another red flag is if it claims to be a long established uh, news website but it has a .co. That can be a red flag because .co is a very, um, very recent domain name um, that you can use. And then fake news follows real news, right? It's very opportunistic. Because when something of note happens and people are clamoring for information, that's the best time to put out this content, right? 
Um, whether it's to you know, drum up confusion and misinformation or to get people to click on your site so that you can make money because people are trying to find information about it. Some trends in 2017, fake crime stories dominated. The one site that benefited the most from Facebook engagements was called World News Daily Report. Everything on that site um, is uh, fake news. There was also a prevalence of create your own news websites. And that's exactly what it seems. Um, so some of them are um, trying to attract people who are trying to prank their friends or you know, create your news, be outrageous type of a thing. Um, but these fake news stories actually gain traction and people actually start believing them and sharing them. And then the emergence of news networks created by one person who mo um, ran multiple fake news sites. So essentially, you know, running an empire of fake news websites and all the money is going to one person. It's, it's, their, um, it's their own fake news media empire. Um, and then copycat sites that were based in Eastern Europe. So here are some of the uh, fake news articles that dominated. I'm not going to be able to read all these titles because <laughs> some are not appropriate for the camera. <laughs> but um, for instance, let's see. Yeah, the Charles Manson to be released on parole to Johnson County, Texas. All right, that got 1.125 million engagements on Facebook. Yes. In 2018, here are some of the top fake news websites. Uh, out of the top 50 fake news stories, nine of them came from this hustlers.com. Uh, nine came from World News Daily Report, the one I mentioned earlier. So you're kind of seeing these websites start to just dominate this fake news space. And then these are the top fake news articles by Facebook engagements for 2018. Uh, former First Lady Barbara Bush dies at 92. Now she did die, but this came out before her death. So you can see how damaging that could be um, to her, you know, her family, her supporters, and just people in general not knowing what's going on. Okay, so this report uh, recently came out from NYU, and they're kind of predicting what's going to happen in this upcoming 2020 election cycle. All right, it's kind of hard to read from probably where you're sitting, so some of the things that they say we have to look out for, deep fake videos, and essentially a deep fake is using um, images and video that are already available and mashing them together using computer algorithms and software to create completely new video and images uh, where you're going to be seeing you know, celebrities, political figures, etc. see uh, doing and saying things that they did not do or say. And right now there's still, you know, some, there's certain tools you can use to and, and sometimes with your naked eye, you can even tell there's something a little off about the video. Uh, but it's going to get better and better to where nobody can, can figure out whether something's real or not. So this is the age that we're entering into. There's going to be uh, digital voter suppression. There's going to be for-profit uh, manipulation services. You know, these companies that... <laughs> Uh, the, their whole business model is around manipulating content because there's big money in it, obviously. Phony memes on Instagram. Instagram's going to be another battleground. Facebook was 2016. Instagram's going to be a big one for 2020. WhatsApp, scare tactics. So who's familiar with WhatsApp? So yeah, it's a messaging service 
Um, and it was actually in the news um, pretty recently because there was a lot of controversy over the elections in Brazil. There's a big misinformation campaign uh, against the current president's uh, uh, competitor. And many feel like that made a difference in the election. Um, and by the way, WhatsApp is owned by Facebook, just as Instagram is. So, um, and then domestically generated distortions, hostile uh, countries um, that are trying to interfere. What are unwitting pro protesters? Unwitting protesters, I think that, that talks to, uh, there's another slide that I'll uh, explain, I think, but what I, let me, there you go, okay. So, uh, one of the big uh, unwitting Americans, unwitting protesters, um, people following these sites um, that oftentimes they create events, like a Facebook event, where they'll create an event for one side and then they'll create an event for another. And it's really just to get them to both show up and fight and argue, right? So there was, um, I don't know if I have the... Yeah, there was one instance, I might not get all the details right, but there was a, um, a Muslim library that had opened up in um, Houston, Texas. And the, um, there was um, this event for people against it, right? And then there was this event for people for it. And both were created by a fake account. Um, and so it's really just to get us to argue and fight. Um, so some of the effects on democracy, at least that I see. So mistrust in media and journalism, it's gonna lead citizens to uh, turn to unreliable sources, right? So as I said earlier, people don't trust media online, but they even they trust mainstream media even less, right? So where do you turn? You're, all right. Um, Americans can't agree on facts. So belief in, it leads to beliefs in, beliefs in false narratives, conspiracy theories, et cetera. Lack of local journalism, as I mentioned before. So that leads to people being less informed especially about their local you know, elections, that what's going on in their cities, their uh, counties, et cetera. And then viewpoints, it's actually been shown that viewpoints become increasingly polarized and partisan when we have less local journalism. Decreased control over uh, personal data, right? So these big tech companies have all our data, we don't own it as a property right or anything. Um, and so, you know, our information is out there and they make money off of it. Um, and really currently there's not too much we can do about that. I mean, we can like do things that safeguard ourselves uh, personally, but in terms of like legislation or anything, there's really nothing protecting us. So, and then there's increased cynicism and pessimism leading to, you know, people not wanting to engage in the political process, not wanting to talk about issues, um, being afraid to even voice their opinion or have a discussion because, you know, you're afraid like, you know, someone would be so, so outraged or, um, you know, uh, react in a really extreme way. As I mentioned, right, there's these fake news generators. And this particular site is called react365.com. And it literally allows you to create a fake news story so easily. Um, you can write whatever you want. You can, it even has a feature where you can search for images on Google to match with your article. And then once it's published, um, it even populates it with an astronomical amount of likes and shares <laughs> that are completely fake. So people looking at this article will be like, oh, it's been shared a bunch of times. This must be right. So, 
So here are just three quick tips I would say. Number one is the most important. Read, listen, watch critically before sharing, right? What I said about 59% of um, people not reading before sharing that uh, Twitter article or article on Twitter, you can cut that down. Just engage with the content. Uh, just read it, see if it makes sense to you. Uh, is the headline matching up? Like, does it just, is it coherent? Does it cite sources? Just very simple stuff. And then check the source. When it does cite, you know, things, when it does use images, um, like, can you trace where they come from? Do, are they citing credible sources? Um, and then look into the author as well. Most articles are going to list an author and, um, you know, usually you can click on their name and they'll show other articles they've written. You can maybe Google their, their name, see what their background is. Just do a little digging into what the source is. And then lastly, what is the support, right? Um, so who are they citing? What evidence are they providing? And um, does it make sense? And if it's too, you know, if it's too like wonky or technical, um, and it's hard to understand, then, you know, either take the time to really dig in and educate yourself about what they're saying, or maybe not share it just yet, right? There's plenty of things that I encounter that I'm just like, oh, I'm not sure if I really understand that law or how they're explaining it or this medical device. I, and if I don't understand it, that's my personal rule. If I don't understand it, I don't share it, right? Some more tips for you. Check the date. You would be shocked how many fake news stories are repurposing uh, something from the past uh, into creating drama or outrage for the present. Is it a joke? Go to the about section of the um, website. You'd be shocked how many of them claim to be satirical news or fantasy news. And if you just go there, you would know, like, okay, I can't take anything here seriously, right? But most people don't know to go there. Check your own biases. Right? I go through this a lot, and I share examples. I'm going to share some later of times when I got duped or almost got duped because I had a strong pull emotionally to the content. You know, we all have biases, we all have points of view, and if we only, um, you know, if we only share things that we agree with, um, or let me just say, we're more likely to not be critical of things we agree with. Is that right? So it's more important to be critical and to take your time with content that um, you have an emotional attachment to. Consult the experts. If it's a br big breaking news story, um, chances are it's not going to be the only news outlet talking about it, right? So check who else is reporting on this. Can you verify from other reliable sources? Have experts on the, in the field been connected to it? Have people on the ground? done investigative reporting. And then you can also check a reliable fact-checking website uh, because oftentimes they'll do a report on a claim or a news story um, that's inaccurate. Um, some of my favorites are uh, Snopes.com, Politifact.com, there's also factcheck.org. Uh, Here's some other red flags. If it has a .co domain, um, that's not always the case, but again, .co is a lot newer. So if someone claims to be ABC News and it, ha it has .co, that's not ABC News. Um, headline is sensational or politically charged. It uses caps or excessive punctuation or very poor grammar. Those are some really <laughs> big red flags. Because oftentimes, you know, um, the things that have really bad grammar or uh, kind of ridiculous punctuation, they're the ones that are written by bots. Um, the language, or just, you know, humans that want to grab your attention, but. <laughs> the language is extreme or opinionated. 
It claims to contain the secret the media, government, big business, whatever the fill in the blank doesn't want you to know about. Like, I'm the only one that's going to tell you the truth. Um, it's designed for easy sharing, like a meme. It insists that you share the information. Right? That's a big red flag. Right? If it tells you you've got to share this with everyone you know, that's a huge sign that you should slow down, really investigate. And this is just one example. The print is really tiny and I can't read it all, but essentially this is a, like, a social media uh, style chain letter that got sent to me um, in 2016 by a very dear friend. Um, it says, I'm just going to read a little bit of it, important message from Crime Stoppers, please read, share to your groups. While driving in rural and in a rural end of the roadway on Thursday morning, I saw an infant car seat on the side of the road with a blanket draped over it. For whatever reason, I did not stop, even though I had all kinds of thoughts running through my head. It goes on to say that gangs and thieves are plotting different ways to get you to stop and essentially murder you. And so they'll leave a baby car seat out. Um, and then you'll see from... The, over here, it's all caps, right? It's really attention grabbing. And, um, wow, I just remember thinking, wow, is this real? That was my first reaction. Like, this, this seems really suspect. And so I fact checked it. I went to Snopes.com. Um, actually, I think what I did, I just Googled, like, um, you know, Crime Stoppers, Baby Bloody Car Seat or something like that. Um, and then it led me to Snopes, and um, what I love about Snopes and any reputable fact-checking website is that they'll lay out the claim, they'll lay out, you know, what they grade it, and then they'll give you all the evidence, right? Um, and so what Snopes did is it looked into this, and from as far back as December 2009, there was a story circulating, um, uh, uh, in messages, like email messages, about this. So this is clearly a very old, like, chain mail type of thing that's now resurfacing. And then here's an example where I s was so close to being tricked. <laughs> so um, this is Emma Gonzalez, right, from Parkland, um, and she was a survivor of the shootings. Um, and I saw this on my social media account, and um, again, I lean very liberal and progressive, um, and I, you know, this, so certain things are going to be expected to show up on my feed, and this is one of the things that showed up, and um, it was promoting the March for Our Lives event, but it was also promoting the shirt that you see her wearing, right? And then I was like, I know I've seen her in that interview before. I don't remember that shirt, but I really want that shirt. <laughs> uh, so I, I was about to click the link and buy a shirt. Um, but before I did that, I did a reverse image search. And it turns out that was not the shirt she was wearing. It was photoshopped in. The shirt she was wearing on CNN interview uh, was, had the Beatles written on it. <laughs> so completely nonpartisan. But somebody was trying to profit off the tragedy. They were not connected to the survivors at all. They created this website, um, started putting out these shirts, um, and making money off of this tragedy. And so I just use this to illustrate, like, both sides of the spectrum, anybody and everybody, is susceptible to this, and it really... Um, and we really need to slow down, and we really need to check the things that we're encountering online. How do you do a reverse image search? Very good question. Yeah. Do we have time to do this? I'm going to quickly show you. Okay. So, if I could. Um, let's see. I may not be able to right now, um, but if you are on 
If you pull up Chrome, it makes it especially easy to use Google Images. Right? So you'll go to Google. Um, let's say you're surfing the web and you encounter an image. You just right click on that image and literally say search Google for image. And it will give you every instance online of that image. And what it does, it doesn't just search the image. It um, searches the patterns in the pixels of the image. So that's why it was able to catch the Emma Gonzalez thing, because it was returning the images where she had the beetles as well, right? Because it was matching the different areas of that photo. Um, and so that was a huge red flag. Um, and then if you're using other browsers, um, you know, you, you can download the image and then re-upload on Google or another image uh, search uh, engine. But if you go to our class, we actually have this exercise. <laughs> oh, and next we're going to do deep fakes. So I actually should have stayed on the browser. So remember I told you about deep fakes as the next level of fake news? Mm -hmm. Check this out. I expected Amy to win. So I, I just like, it was just, I, this, was, this was very truly surprising for me. Um, yeah, I, I was just really surprised. Hi. Here. Uh, Sheridan Watson from BuzzFeed right here. Hi. Um, so you're a huge Bravo fan. Oh, Who yes. was your favorite and least favorite housewife of all cities? <laughs> um, my favorite is probably Lisa Vanderpump. Um, my least favorite, I don't want to have to say. I mean, I don't want to have to say, because who knows when you're going to run into these people, you know? Over here to your right. I hope I don't. I hope I'm never in that like situation where I'm like, all the housewives are here. Anyway, <laughs> actually, I take that back. I do want to be in that situation. Jennifer, over here. Yes, to your Sam right. Smith. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I have a so that is Steve Buscemi's face <laughs> um, on uh, J Jennifer Lawrence's body. Um, yeah. Uh, and then, um, I mean, there's just countless examples now. And um, basically, anybody with a computer um, who can get a hold of one of these uh, programs that are being more, that are becoming more prevalent um, can make stuff like this. You know, it's becoming very, very common. Um, and the software is getting better. No, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know anybody can do that. No, it's it was you can meme somebody's face over something, but that's No, they have programs now where you can um, you know, like input video and then like put someone's face in it. Yeah. Yeah, a lot, a lot of the development happened actually in the University of Washington. <laughs> Interestingly, yeah. Um, so this quote says, deep fakes can be made by anyone with a computer, internet access, and interest in influencing an election. Um, so, I love this quote. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. Right? And, um, you know, it, it's kind of, I find it kind of strange that I'm a librarian trying to teach humility. That's kind of, but that, I feel like th that is one of the biggest keys to um, getting getting our grasp on uh, this issue is because, um, you know, when you, f when you feel like you're knowledgeable or you feel like you're right or you feel like, you know, you this information has to get out, 
that's when it's most likely to be fake, and that's when it's most likely to do harm. Um, and so, you know, just taking that introspective approach and really questioning, okay, do I really have a full grasp on this? Have I checked enough sources? Have I gotten enough expert opinions and, and listened to different sides of the issue um, for me to really share this in a responsible way? And I think uh, that approach is the hardest, but is the most, um, it's, is the most fruitful um, and responsible. Um, and then here's another example <laughs> that I talk about. Um, Google is so tricky. Um, I remember a couple years back I was going to a conference with my union at the library and um, they were going to reimburse me for a hotel and everything and I was searching for a hotel. It was going to be at the Red Lion in Olympia, right? So this particular day I think I was like, you know, I had just come off a desk, tough reference question or whatever. My brain wasn't all there. So I just Googled Red Lion Olympia, and I clicked on the first yeah, result that popped up. And you're probably thinking, no, don't do that, <laughs> right? Um, because the first two or three results are always going to be sponsored ads. And in this case, it was a sponsored um, ad, and it was for a third party. I don't know why these things exist or are allowed to exist, but it was this third-party agency that books for you for certain hotels and what they did was gave me a $45 you know surtax and additional fees that were non-refundable meanwhile I thought it was the Red Lion Hotel that I was doing business with directly because it's got the logo there and it's got everything you know to make me think that it's Red Lion but it wasn't and so I just use this example as like I teach this stuff for a living and I get tricked. So again, there's that humility. It's like, like you know, we're going to mess up, we're going to make mistakes, and we, we also have to own up to that and kind of let people know like, oh, hey, if we got tricked or we, we shared something that wasn't right, correct it and let people know. And, you know, also when people share things that aren't accurate, you know, gently and with kindness and love, you know, <laughs> show them you know where they may have gone wrong and, and um, the evidence that says otherwise because um, we really need to be a community of fact checkers we can't just rely on the big tech companies to do all this because um, clearly they're not able to be successful um, so, okay some final thoughts um, we talked about the new economy of online news, um, but I also want you to think about when I talked about earlier about how our information is used by these tech companies to make money, right? So when you get something for free online, you don't actually get it for free, right? You are the product. Your information is the product. Um, and I welcome you um, fact-checking me on this. It's just something I heard. I, di I did not <laughs> check this. But I heard that a study came out that said our um, data is now worth more than oil. Um, and so, again, check that. <laughs> That's your homework. Is that true? Um, but if it is true, it's like, <laughs> you know, we are the product. They're ga gathering all this data from us, and we're... Like, we're getting some convenience back, but are we, are we really in control of our data? And that's a whole other conversation about, like, you know, should we own our own data? Should we have more um, things in place for us to, to be able to opt into things rather than have to opt out? Um, and should we know where our data is going and, where, and how much money is being made off of it? And, how, and should we maybe get some of that money back? Um, so there's just all these issues. Um, and then, of course, don't trust one source completely, right? Like, no matter how much, you know, um, you love this source, and no matter how many Pulitzers, it's one, you know, it's not infallible, and it always um, will benefit you to check various sources as well as, you know, various mediums. 
uh, like we were talking about earlier, tri-radio, newspaper, online, all the above. Um, and then if you see something that can genuinely be a scam or illegal behavior, report it uh, to FTC as well as uh, the Attorney General's. How do you know it's illegal? Or might be illegal. Or, you know, like, um, for, for example, um, the, um, the news article earlier about the brain booster, I actually reported it to the FTC. Um, and then they kind of, <laughs> they, sh they shot me an email that says we're looking into it and we haven't heard back. But, um, you know, that kind of thing where they're literally using um, fake um, spokespeople, like real people as spokespeople, like that starts to kind of get into the territory of like, this isn't like legal maybe. Um, but yeah, it's not up to us to determine, but like, you know, if you suspect something is, is off, something's illegal or a scam, if someone's trying to get money from you, report that. Uh, report that to the authorities. And then take a class, read books about evaluating information. This is kind of like a lifelong uh, skill that you have to develop. And it takes time and it takes a lot of practice. Um, and then another th thought I want to leave you with is um, critical reading and thinking versus passive. Um, and this is something I think about a lot um, because we, we tend to be, myself included, we tend to be very passive consumers online. Right? It's so easy for me to just pull out my phone, get on Twitter, and just kind of like look through, scroll through. Okay, that happened. That, that's out there. Um, but being a critical reader and thinker takes time. It takes, it takes your investing that uh, effort and time into it um, and really checking uh, on the sources. And while that can be time consuming and, and can be... Um, a little bit more difficult, in the long run, it really creates a more in, informed citizenry and democracy for us all. Um, so I just want to leave you with that thought. Um, and any questions you have, you can reach me via email, grab a business card, please, and reach out to me. And right now, I think we have about 20 or 30 minutes for questions, so. When are, are these classes being taught? Right, so we typically we have one class per quarter at the Central Library in downtown Seattle. And then I've had colleagues adapt it for branch libraries as well uh, as either a class or a um, presentation. And then um, I go to places like this uh, to okay. present as well. Um, I've presented at Bainbridge, I think it was 2017, October. Um, and then I recently, um, it was a lot of fun, I met with uh, the Bainbridge Oatmeal Club. Does anybody know about them? They're awesome, They're awesome right? So yeah, I got a chance to present to them. Um, and I only got like 40 minutes, so you guys got the long version, um, the more complete version, but um, it was a lot of fun. So uh, I actually have to check on when the next class is. Uh, I'll try to check that right now. It's going to be in November and I will be teaching. Um, a lot of the content is going to be the same as what I'm presenting today, but we'll have a lot more time to do these exercises and to actually go on a computer and like you know, do some fact checking. Yeah, I'm checking on that. Yeah, you can just go to spl.org uh, and search our events calendar. Just type in fake news. Uh, but yeah, if you're interested or you have questions, just reach out to me. Thank you. Hey, I think it's about time to wrap it up. Uh, thank you so much. It was fascinating. Program. It's great to be here. Thank you all. Thank you.